I have had a somewhat eclectic pharmacy career, as you could tell. But lately I have been, and I'm now a certified integrative health coach, which is where just my passion lies, and especially in weight management coaching. I'm not going to talk much about that today, but that's, that's sort of where I'm coming at this from. And really, as I'm developing my, my coaching approach, like really what I'd like to focus on, I have, I have come to the conclusion that several of the most vexing problems that we all have have a similar, um, a sort of similar source, and therefore a similar kind of set of tools should be able to be applied to any of them. So when you think about it, what our problem with time management, weight management, money management, or um, stuff management is supposed to be that, that empty space down there, just you know things and clutter. We have a limited container of some sort. We either have a certain number of hours in the day or a certain number of calories that we can consume to maintain the weight we want to maintain. We have a set salary. We have a set amount of physical space. But there are unlimited inputs competing for the space in those containers. And because we don't really have a good way of, of dealing with that unlimited input, we end up Well, let's see. We should end up revealing something on this slide that isn't happening. Let's try this. Well, okay, We're, we should be revealing this bunch of, oh, there we go, there we go. We, <laughs> we end up, we end up overscheduled, overweight, um, in debt, and just with more stuff than we can manage. So We're that's, <laughs> well, because, you know, we, we tend to be happy in our oblivion um, about stuff. We just, we just, like, smile it away. And I have this dream of starting a blog that will be called TimeWeightMoneyStuff.com and have actually one entry, and that's as far as I got with that before the person who was supposed to be helping me with the Internet sort of disappeared, and um, you don't need to hear that awful story. But I hope that you will remember that. It's in your slides, and someday come visit me if, if what I say intrigues you and you'd like to hear more. So uh, as I said, I have had a um, sort of um, difficult weight odyssey um, starting around the time I was 30. Before then, I was just, a, I would say, like a typical normal weight woman, and we'll get into normal in a little bit, just you know, obsessing about how much I weighed. But by the time of my mid-30s, I crept up to 150 pounds. I'm 5 foot 5 inches tall. And my primary care doctor at the time told me that I should think about losing weight while I still could. So I joined Weight Watchers and lost weight and maintained that weight until around 1998 when I got married. And um, got married, had been single that whole time. My husband and I started, well, I started cooking and I'd split the portions between us. And um, as you can see, that turned out to be a little more food than I needed. And I had a sort of stressful period there of working as an experiential training coordinator, a, a director at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy. That is not my job, believe me, that, that was not a good fit for me. I ate, stress ate my way through that job. And before I knew it, I was um, up over 180 pounds, more than I imagined I could ever weigh. Um, and it might have been more, I stopped weighing myself. So I, then I had some fits and starts, and then in 2008 I joined Jenny Craig, which brought me down to the weight I'm at today, and I've maintained that weight loss since then, but I've started putting weight back on, and we'll get into that also. So what we're going to cover today, these are in your packet, but I'm basically going to be talking to you about where we are with guidelines, what we know and don't know about losing weight, what the sort of current thinking is, and then we're going to go a little bit into the new drugs. I'll tell you right now, though, as far as any medications, we still do not have what people are looking for, which is the drug that will let us eat whatever we want and still lose weight. Waiting for that one. We all are waiting for that one, and believe me, the, pharmace the pharmaceutical companies know that we are, and I imagine one day we're going to get it, if it is possible. So let's talk a little bit about the problem, and the problem, like what, what are we talking about when we're talking about obesity, and what are our current guidelines? Well, current, our guidelines were actually created back in 1998. And we've been hearing that there's going to be new guidelines for quite a while, and actually were promised guidelines at the end of 2012. And we pretty firmly said they will be out at the end of 2012. So at this point, all that's left really is to ask the Magic 8-Ball. So uh, Magic 8-Ball, when will we have our updated obesity guidelines? Uh-oh. Reply hazy. 
Now, I keep a lot of stuff, and one of the things that I found in a file as I was preparing for it, I spoke at the American Pharmacists Association earlier this year, and one of the things I found in my file is back in 2007, um, we, were, we had an expected release date of 2009 for what they call obesity 2, the updated clinical guidelines on the identification, evaluation, and treatment of overweight and obesity in adults. So then preparing for the talk, I went to the NIH website and I found this, which was showing the status of all of the things. We were supposed to get the new cholesterol guidelines, ATP4, the new um, blood pressure guidelines, JNC8, the new obesity guidelines, and then a couple of other ones, uh, an overall sort of cardiovascular risk assessment one. So it, I see back in March that they're in progress. Uh, as they have been since apparently like 2007. So, uh, and again, despite being promised at the end of 2012. So I went back to update this before I came up here, and, and I find this graphic, and, and I was like, okay, what, what the heck is this? And um, so I was like, wait, Systematic Evans Review? Guidelines and like, what the heck? Okay, so what happened apparently in June is NIH just sort of gave up the fight, and they have announced that they're getting out of the guidelines business altogether, they are instead going to focus on creating systematic evidence reviews, and it's going to be up to professional societies to come up with the guidelines. So my understanding is that the American Heart Association and American, American College of Cardiology are now taking over the responsibility for obesity guidelines. So our, the reply truly is hazy. I mean, this, this one came out of left field, so I don't know what to tell you about that. So we're still talking about what we talked about in 1998, which is that um, Body mass index is how we determine whether someone is overweight or obese. And body mass index is the ratio of weight to height, and it, is, it has been shown to be a good predictor of, of how much fat you have specifically. The classifications are that um, you are overweight at a BMI of 25 and obese at a BMI of 30 or above, and then there are various classifications of obesity. Although we can, you can use that equation I showed you, it's far easier to use one of these tables that where you can look down the side at your height, move across to find your weight, and then you move up to find out what your BMI is. I always like to leave this up there for a moment in case anyone's having their just, you know, personal moment of, um, of, of you know, oh, e either like, oh, yay, or oh, no. So... <laughs> What happened in this country is where we really started to see the rates of obesity increase was after 1980, and an especially dramatic increase beginning at about 1990. And while there's been a lot of speculation on what caused all of this, the, it seems like the majority opinion is coming down to just, we eat too much. And we eat a lot more than we used to. And these numbers might be wrong in your handout, because um, PowerPoint likes to try to give different presentations than the one I, I actually want to give. So um, back in 1970, the average adult was eating about uh, just a little over 2,000 calories. By 2010, that average had bumped up to 2,614 calories per day, which is enough to explain a lot of the increase in what's been going in, in in the obesity rates. So I can tell you about this, but really the best way is just to show it. And this is a series of slides that have been available from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that, that literally show the changing trends in obesity in the United States. I'm, hopefully the animation will work here. And as you watch these, just remember that what we have going on here, white was no data. But light blue was sort of like less than 10%. You're just going to see the colors change. Dark blue is not so good. As we move out of blue, we're getting into even higher rates of obesity per state. And I just, I invite you all to join me in rooting for Colorado. So here we are back in the late 80s. As you can see now, a lot of states, we get the first introduction of more than 15%. Then we start seeing more than 20%, you know, more than 20%, then more than 25% of people in the state of obese. Then more than 30%. This is where, like, I, I just keep rooting for Colorado here. Oh, man. Finally, at the end, 2010, Colorado gives up the fight, and they're over 20% as well. So this brings us to the current, um, to, to today, 
where more than two-thirds of adults are overweight or obese, and specifically about 70% at least overweight, 36% obese, um, and 6.3% extremely obese. And the pre predictions are things keep going the way they are. By 2030, two in five adults will be obese, and one in 10 will be what's classified as extremely obese. We're also, of course, seeing a problem in children, where one in three, about one in three children right now are classified as overweight or obese. These, the charts on the bottom, BMI, it's, done, it's figured a little differently in children where it's more, um, obesity is defined as being at or above the 95th percentile on these growth charts. So I noticed that you guys have the cards. So we can do a little active learning just to make, you know, just to give you something like here, you can stretch your arms a little bit. Like, as you'll see, every little bit helps. So, you know, hold those cards high. So under the current guidelines, who weight loss is recommended for all adults with a BMI of at least what? Okay, anyone who didn't raise it, are you still thinking or you just, just, just don't have the energy? It's okay, I get it. <laughs> all right. Well, actually, it's recommended for all adults with a BMI of at least 30. If you're overweight, which would have been answer B, um, you, it's, it's recommended, now this is guidelines, recommended if you're in the overweight category and have at least two risk factors or have a high risk weight circumference and at least two risk factors. And the risk factors are, are sort of all of the usual cardiometabolic culprits. I'm not going to read them off to you. You should have this in your slides. But generally, you know, the things that you'd think of as, as being risk factors. So in our current guidelines, the approach is that we reduce body weight by 10% from baseline over six months. And keep that in mind as I continue to talk, that we're looking at 10% from baseline over six months. The rec it is recommended that we lose weight at a relative, relatively gradual pace of one to two pounds per week, or as you can see in the, the sort of caveat little line there, perhaps one half to one pound per week at lower starting weights. We achieve that rate of weight loss by creating an energy deficit of 500 to 1,000 calories per day, or again, at a lower starting weight, perhaps like say in the overweight range, uh, a calorie deficit of 300 to 500 calories a day. And we, we the, the, the approach, the, the multi-component approach as it's called, is a combination of dietary therapy, increased physical activity, and behavior therapy, which, is, which are things like just, oh, basically it's behavior change. How do we change our behaviors in this regard? This bizarrely um, printed thing from the NIH, th this is actually a screen grab. And I'm sorry it's not easy to see, but they, for some reason, chose to print it in this odd blue color on white paper with pink highlights. But this is, um, and I'll, I will walk over carefully because I have my reading glasses on and try to point to something here in case you can't see it. I have this up here so that you can see that for pharmacotherapy and, and surgery. Wait, this is pharmacotherapy here? And this is surgery. And drug therapy is recommended for pretty much the same um, groups that, that just weight loss is recommended for, but not until, um, or actually, I'm, if, if for anybody who's obese, for the higher end of the overweight range with, with, comorbid, with at least one comorbidity. And, um, and then surgery is recommended for anyone who is obese and has comorbidities, although that's thinking is starting to change. And I'm really not going to get into weight loss surgery at all during this talk. It just sort of takes us off in a whole different direction. But what I wanted to, oops, well, how do I go back? There we go. Excellent. What I want to show you here is that pharmacotherapy and the guidelines is recommended only after a six-month trial of, of, of lifestyle change, essentially. So it's not meant in the guidelines, again, but back to 1998, as, as an initial therapy. First, you try dietary therapy. If it doesn't work, then we move to the drug therapy. The comorbidities that they talk about are these, coronary heart disease, dyslipidemia, hypertension, sleep apnea, or type 2 diabetes. So do we have anything more current to go off of than 1998 guidelines? Yes, we have this 
um, U.S. present, pre, oh, I can I never say this, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation statement, which pretty much says the same things the current guidelines do, that weight loss is recommended for everyone with a BMI of 30 or greater, that we, that um, physicians should, you know, offer or refer patients to this intensive multi-component approach of dietary therapy, increased physical activity, and behavior change strategies, and that we can expect from these a weight loss, an average weight loss of somewhere between like 9 and 16 pounds. Now, if you remember back to the guidelines, 10% of body weight over about six months was the goal. If you think of just an average um, of a starting weight of about 200 pounds, that's not going to get you to your 10% weight loss which is why sort of the drug therapy starts coming into the picture. Also, big hoopla back in June that the American Medical Association had voted in its House of Delegates to classify obesity as a disease. And there's been a, a huge amount of controversy about this, and a, apparently, you know, whether obesity really should be considered a disease. But it seems like why, if you, if you look at what, what the AMA was saying about why they did this, why they voted this way, it was to start bringing just more attention, and especially among physicians, to get them to start taking obesity treatment seriously. So we really can't talk about weight management until we talk about and understand energy balance. Because at the end of the day, we are all governed by the first law of thermodynamics, which is that um, our energy, we are in energy balance. So we are, and our body weight is not going to change if over a specified time, our energy intake and our energy output are equal. Our intake is what we bring in from food. Our output is our physical activity. So the components of energy intake, we generally talk in term of, terms of the macronutrients, which are carbohydrates, protein, fat, and alcohol, and a little class by itself. But um, go back. I wasn't ready for you yet. Um, carbohydrates and protein both, of, both bringing in about 4 calories per gram consumed. Fat, more than twice that at 9 calories per gram consumed, which is where a lot of the emphasis on low-fat eating comes in. It's way easier to... to make a calorie deficit if you're cutting fat out. Alcohol at about se somewhere in the between about seven calories per gram, and generally considered to offer nothing but a good time. <laughs> in other words, no, no real nutrient value at all. Our energy output is composed of resting metabolic rate, which is the majority of our energy output, and that's just sort of what it takes to keep us alive and functioning. Then we have the thermic effect of food, the TEF, which is the, how much energy we expend to actually consume and digest our food. If you ever hear about those foods that have a negative calorie balance, like celery, you know, exactly, celery, that's, that means that, that celery generally has fewer calories in it than the energy it takes to, to actually process it. I would not recommend basing your whole weight management strategy on celery, though. Um, also, then we have activity energy expenditure, which is really the hunk that's under our control. And that consists of both planned exercise as well as what's called NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is things just like moving around. It's standing versus sitting. It's fidgeting versus sitting still. So we have a lot of problems, though. This energy balance seems like it should be pretty straightforward, and it seems like it should be pretty straightforward then to manage our weight. The problem is there's a lot of things we still don't know. One of the things we don't know is what period of time is important for energy balance. We don't really know. We know that from day to day, it doesn't make that big of a difference. You can overeat on Thanksgiving and not wake up five pounds heavier and, and you know, a sustained five pound weight loss. We also know that you can severely cut your calories one day and wake up and not have really lost any weight, very depressingly. So we're trying to figure out what is the time frame that's important for this. And it, it really seems like it's more a matter of weeks rather than, than days. We don't really know how many calories we need. Any one of you, if I asked you how many calories should you be consuming each day, I'm going to guess you couldn't tell me because I couldn't tell you. And I, I obsess about this a lot more than anyone else here, I would imagine. And um, I mean from you know, the fact that I'm reading all of this and putting together presentations. So the best we have are these, eps are these sort of estimates that we get from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. And as you can see, they are divided up by how active we are and, and by our age and whether we're a woman or a man, but not much else. So 
I fall into that woman, 51 plus, probably sedentary, 1,600 calories. I mean, that's, that's a prediction. It's an estimate. It may or may not be true for me in that category. We, since we don't know how many calories we should be consuming, we also really don't know how to establish the calorie deficit we need for weight loss. So if you look at the guidelines to, to cut out 500 to 1,000 calories per day, we, we don't know what the start is. What's the end? You know, we have like an A plus B equals C where we don't know any of the variables. This is a chart I took from a book called The Dash Diet for Weight Loss. And while I will speak very highly of this book later on, I did want to point out here that um, this, this chart is kind of a little ridiculous. Because if you look at the sedentary column there, for the weights, you know, you can see up to about 170 pounds, the target's 1,200, and then at 180, it's 1,202. Like, what, you know, so what, you can get a piece of gum? Yeah. I, I, and I look at some of these, 1,388. This chart implies a level of precision that simply is not possible for any of us. We also really don't know the relative contributions of diet and exercise in weight management. You know, obviously, we know that we get out of balance. We, be, you know, we become overweight or obese because our intake is exceeding our output. But we really don't know. There's a lot of debate on what is the best strategy going forward. And we're only just beginning to really understand the unbelievably complicated homeostatic mechanism for maintaining um, just, just energy regulation, just how we eat, what governs when, why we eat, how much we eat, when we want to eat. I'm not going to go into this. Don't worry, I'm not going into this diagram much. I threw this up just to say that we are now really just starting to figure out the different hormones and various things that are involved in our regulating things. And we also are just starting to figure, a, figure out how those things get out of whack, either when we are overweight or when we lose weight. And especially what drives weight regain, because you can lose weight, as anyone in this um, room knows. Actually, let me ask, how many people here have ever lost weight, just lost weight? How many people maintained that weight loss successfully for at least a year? Excellent. Excellent. So anybody who maintained that weight loss, was it easy? I'm generally seeing a shaking the head, no, it's not easy. And it's not easy for reasons we'll get into a little bit later. It's not easy for me. It's, it's one reason I've started gaining weight back. More unknowns. We don't really know. We, we, BMI is kind of our gospel for weight management, but we really don't know that BMI is the best indicator. There's a lot of discussion that it is not the best indicator. And as a matter of fact, where there was some controversy where people at the AMA wanted to not vote for obesity to be considered to be a disease state, one of, the, one of the objections was that BMI is not a good diagnostic predictor, and we don't have a good diagnostic predictor. We're starting to get some indication that obesity can become irreversible. Now, this is just from animal studies right now, but showing that if you have been overweight, and especially the more overweight you've been, for a longer and longer amount of time, that it becomes, it actually does become more and more difficult to lose weight. That, that the strategies that are recommended might really not work for people. You become resistant. And then there is now the whole idea of whether genetic analysis is going to have a role in weight management, whether there's going to be precision medicine the way we're starting to see in other disease states. We at least know about um, the variant in the FTO gene where people are 70% more likely to become obese. And then we know that, that FTO regulates ghrelin, which is one of the hormones that was in the other slide that regulates appetite. So until we figure, you know, there, there could be, you know, people sort of blame, it's my genes, you know, it actually could be their genes, so we can't just roll our eyes anymore. A big problem, though, is that up until now, what we've been talking about is what regulates hunger and intake kind of from a physiologic perspective. Oop. What we really don't know much about at all is hedonic eating, or basically eating just because we feel like it. And that is a huge factor 
in weight management because as, as everyone in here knows, we don't just, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but uh, I don't just eat to live. I imagine most of you don't eat to live. Eating factors into our social um, activities. Mm -hmm. I, I eat for stress. Um, it's not the best way to manage stress, but it, that's, you know, that's what I do. Many people eat for stress. So there's many things that drive what we do that aren't related to any of these things that are being studied. And until we really have a better understanding of hedonic eating, we're going to have a difficult time with weight management. There's also starting to be a, a controversy, although some kind of convincing evidence, that it is possible to have food addictions. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, and I'll tell you right now, I'm not exactly certain what these scans are showing. But what I can tell you is this was a very interesting experiment of about 50 uh, college-age women. And they were hooked up to a functional MRI. And they, were, they looked at a computer screen. And they also had some gadget set up that would give them little tastes of something. So they would be shown on the computer screen a photo of either a yummy chocolate shake or just a glass of water. And then there would be a, a little pause, and they would actually get a taste of either the yummy chocolate shake, or it wasn't actually water. It was just a tasteless control solution, because apparently water actually sort of stimulates our taste buds. So, And what they found here is what these scans show is that um, over on the, the left, that the bars on the left side versus the right side are women who um, before they, they did all of these imaging studies, the women filled out a uh, questionnaire designed to show whether or not they showed, um, they showed any tendency toward a food addiction. The people on the left are the ones who did. And really, the takeaway from this slide is what they found is that the people who had, who, who based on the questionnaire, seemed to have a, a predilection toward food addiction um, they were. They got far more excited about the idea of getting a chocolate shake than the other folks did, but they didn't really enjoy it as much as the other folks did. And these are the same kind of patterns you see with substance abusers. So we're starting to see that for some food, at least, are they are that it's acting in our brain the same way that that um, substances of abuse would. And. We're, a lot of the attention is coming now is on foods with a high glycemic index. And the glycemic index being the degree to which a specific food raises blood sugar after you eat it in the immediate postprandial period. And, and it's in reference to a standard, which generally is white bread, you know, Wonder Bread. And what we find really are just, at the bottom line is, is foods with a high glycemic index tend to be the highly processed carbohydrates, the whites, white bread, white pasta, white rice, white potatoes, especially mashed potatoes and white sugar. And another imaging study that was done in men found a very similar thing, that the um, foods with a high glycemic index, they were given a meal with a high glycemic index, it was actually a shake, with a high glycemic index, one with a low glycemic index. The one with a high glycemic index selectively stimulated the brain regions that are associated with reward and craving, again, much like Substance of, substances of abuse would, and in a way that made them want to keep eating more and more of the refined carbohydrates. So they basically kind of lost their inhibition. Another problem we have is that we either don't have data we need, or the data we have are misleading. This, um, this study, this graph comes from a study where a, a group of researchers out in the Boston area went out to some just independent restaurants, the kind of restaurants you'd find just in, in downtown Traverse City, say, mm -hmm. and bought meals, an, an entree and its sides, to, to represent a variety of different cuisines. And, what, and they took them and uh, they analyzed them in a bomb cal calorimeter to find out how many calories are in each meal. And what they found was that the average meal, and this is the, the entree and the sides, the average meal was about 1,300 calories. The red line that you see represents about 660 calories, which if you divide like a 2,000, a target 2,000 calorie a day intake into thirds, arguably the, the dinner should not have exceeded like 600, like let, let's say 700 calories, and instead it was up around 1,300, almost twice as much. There were a couple of meals that actually contained what would have been an entire calorie allotment for the day. 
So let's say, okay, then my strategy is I'm just not going to eat out, and I'll have to be very careful eating out. It'll just be a treat like it used to be back in the 60s. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go with the packaged foods because I know how many calories they contain. Or do we? The same group did a similar kind of analysis, bought some frozen foods, stuck them in a bomb calorimeter, and what did we find? We found that this specific lean cuisine, shrimp and angel hair pasta, oops, um, was stated at 250 calories, but actually measured out at 315. Same thing with one of the Weight Watchers entrees. Now the difference isn't huge, it's about 50, 60 calories, but think back to that chart where they're saying, you know, 1,356 calories per day. You could be doing, you could think that you're doing everything right, and look, and you know, still, we just, we don't have the data. Part of my Jenny Craig membership had been that I could do this thing, this body media fit, and just for the sake, just for the heck of it, I thought, why not? So I had to wear this band on my arm. You know, these things are becoming very popular, these monitors. So I wore this one on my arm for about a week just to see what it would say. So after the first day, this, this, um, the graph up at the top left here, it said that I was, I had burned um, 1,940 calories, which seemed like a, a lot to me based on how much I knew I was eating. And I thought, well, that, that was kind of an anomaly that day. I was out doing a lot of errands. I went to Sam's Club. I walked all around the whole club. I mean, that's got to be about six miles or so. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll wear it for a couple of more days and see what it says. Oh, and I'm sorry, my actual, there was, that's right, it was 2,413. Sorry, it was showing my target. My actual, it said I was burning 2,413 calories, which I thought there was absolutely no way. So again, you know, maybe Sam's Club factored into that. So I wore it around for a week. A typical week, I do a lot of freelance program development work. I'm usually sitting in a home office. I'm, I'm home-based. No, no, this is eating my regular stuff. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, I didn't input. I didn't input any of my food stuff. I was, I was really mostly interested in the physical activity aspect of this. So just, you know, sitting in my office, what, what was it? And as you can see, this chart down at the bottom, it was 2,071 calories. And I'm just thinking, I don't think that's right. I just, and my husband and I came up with the theory that we think that monitor might have been misinterpreting my hot flashes as bouts of vigorous physical activity. <laughs> And all I can say is, you know, oh, that that were the case. <laughs> so, um, so just be careful if you are in my age group and, and you are wearing one of these monitors. But if I were eat, if I were taking that as true, and I go, oh, hey, yay, I got two thousand calories a day. I can tell you right now, I'd be, I would be putting weight on at a far faster rate. Another thing that has just come to light recently is, is something we've held as gospel for a very long time is, is not true and, and is misleading patients and giving them false expectations about how weight loss is going to occur. So here's a little bit of math. You know, I figure it's, it's almost the end of the symposium. Let's see how you guys are processing. If you reduce your energy intake by 500 calories a day, how many pounds do you lose in each week? If you know this, you know this. You don't even have to do the math. So if you think you know this, go ahead and raise up your card. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of Bs, which yes, 500 calories a day, which means over seven days you're gonna, you will reduce 3,500 calories. And indeed, 3,500 calories is one pound. And so what we, uh, what we tell people, right, is to lose that weight at the gradual pace of one to two pounds per week. We create that calorie deficit and we will lose the weight. Basically, I mean, the, the, the assumption is we lose it pretty literally, linearly, so that uh, a 500 calorie a day deficit um, should, we should drop a pound a week, you know, just kind of over the, kind of indefinitely. But as you can see, this is how I lost weight after I um, joined Jenny Craig. And this is um, what the graph kind of takes us out over three years. And what you can see is that I lost a whole bunch of weight. It's, it might be hard to see the bottom things. But by June, February, March, so in the first four months, I lost almost 20 pounds. Then it took me another about four months, five months to lose another 10 pounds. But then it took almost a year to lose the last 10 pounds. So a lot of weight up front. But again, I don't know what my start was. You know, I don't know, I don't know what this calorie deficit was. 
but I know what I was eating, which was pretty because I stuck with that frozen food, like, because I was like, I'm doing this, and I'm doing it right, and it was designed to be about 1,300, 1,350 calories a day. So, as you can see, a lot in the beginning, and then the, the sort of, you know, the dreaded plateau. But the plateau is actually to be expected, because what, what this thinking does, as when we kind of pair up the calorie deficit in time, is that we're not accounting for the physiologic adaptations, oops, that happen as we lose weight. And specifically, as our body weight decreases, our resting metabolic rate decreases, and the amount of energy that we expend through exercise and just that, that activity, um, that also decreases. There's less of us, so there's less of us to move around, and we're expending less energy. So as we lose weight, we only have a 500-calorie deficit if we continue to eat less. See, so if we if we say, okay, I'm going to eat, you know, I'm going to go on a 1,300-calorie a day diet. I'm just going to stay with that till I lose the weight. You can do that, but then you get a weight loss, kind of like what you saw with me. And the new thinking is that really what is happening is that a a, a permanent 10-calorie change in how much we eat will eventually result in one pound of body weight when we reach our new steady state, and that according to the predictions it would take one year to achieve 50% of the likely weight loss and three years to achieve 90%, 95% of the likely weight loss. Again, based on maintaining a, a, a set deficit. So that a 500 calorie deficit would be expected to result in a 25 pound weight loss in one year. Not the 50 pounds that we would expect if we just used that linear, um, kind of, you know, that linear cap, um, graph. There's actually a body weight simulator. This, these are researchers from the um, NIDDK, the National Institute of Diabetes. I always get this one wrong. Diabetes and digest. You know which one I'm talking about. NIDDK. And you can go on the website. I have the, the URL in your handout. And this is a simulator where you can punch in a lot of different variables. And it will tell people when, essentially, like what kind of trajectory they can expect for weight loss. So that hopefully, you know, then if you know what you're going into, then you don't start blaming yourself when your weight loss starts to slow down. Or you understand that your reward for losing weight is that, yeah, you get to eat even less food than you've been eating. So what about the role of diet and exercise? Well, one of the ways I amuse myself in supermarkets or just in, you know, places like Meyer and Target is I get in the longest line I can and I read the, the magazines. I look at the headlines of the magazines because I can always... I can, I'm just assured of being outraged by some woman's magazine promising something ridiculous in terms of weight management. And then Real Simple, the latest issue of Real Simple shows up in my mailbox the other day, and I'm just like, et to Real Simple, because here on the cover, diet versus exercise, which works better? And I thought, oh, no, no, please don't be doing this, this pitting of diet and exercise. And it turned out the, ex the, the article wasn't, saying which works better for weight loss. It was for a variety of things. But there is a lot of debate. You know, people will say, oh, I'm just going to exercise and lose weight. Or, you know, do I really need to exercise to lose weight? And the current thinking really is that the reduced calorie eating plan is the most important for weight loss. But exercise is most important for weight maintenance. You still have to be careful about what you eat. But really what's going to help you with weight maintenance is exercise. Exercise will contribute to weight loss, and it will certainly contribute to how you lose weight. In other words, like whether you're maintaining muscle mass and things, but, but it's not going to cause the weight loss that most people want. So unfortunately, what a lot of people do, I know is, you know, we go out and we like, okay, I need to, I need to cut down what I eat, so we go out and find the book. And the thing with the books is these, these books aren't solutions. Like nobody has come up here with the secret to weight loss. What, what any of the popular books do essentially is come up with a system, a strategy for creating a calorie deficit. And none of them really is, you know, is certainly none of them is perfect, and very few of them work for most people. So beyond just like the books, there's, there's also a lot of discussion about what is the best kind of macronutrient um, composition 
for weight loss. And this was especially a big topic when the, the last time the Atkins diet was very popular, and I guarantee you that is going to come back. It has this little cycle of coming back every so often as being very, very popular. So which of the following types of diets is best for weight loss? Any guesses on this one? I'm sorry? I was going to answer the question. Oh, well, you're welcome to answer it on the sheet, but I'm looking. Just hold up your cards. Go ahead, take a guess. There's no penalties for wrong answers here. We're among friends. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of C's, a lot of C's and sort of all over the map, uh, a little bit all over the map. Well, so, okay, and really was, I was seeing a lot of votes for the low glycemic index diet. So when we're talking about diet compositions, like this, this is what we're talking about. What is the percentage of fat? What's the percentage of carb? What's the percentage of protein? And, and sort of modifying those to see what has, a, um, uh, what has an effect. And low glycemic index sort of fits in here. If you're following a low glycemic index diet, and, and just as an aside, if anyone decided that that was a strategy, I would say stay away from the whole actual index because then you start getting into nutty categories. Um, like there's, that index really was created to help people manage diabetes, not to, to, be, like to help manage you know, postprandial spikes. It wasn't meant as a weight loss index. And you'll find things like carrots. Oh, you should stay away from carrots. And like, no, carrots aren't our problem. Anybody here get really overweight because they ate too many carrots? So um, it's more to think about it in terms of emphasizing low glycemic index foods, which are just, it's what's recommended. You know, it's the whole grains. It's the healthy fats. It's, so that, the low glycemic index diet would probably fall probably around those two middle ones, around what, where the examples were like South Beach or, or the USDA and the DASH diet. And when, what, so a couple of studies decided, you know what, we're going to you know, put this to rest once and for all, and we're just going to pit all these diets against each other and see who does best. And what they found was really the bottom line was the best diet was sort of a trick question. It's the one that you're going to adhere to because we're looking at a long-term strategy. So it doesn't matter. Pick the one that you think you can stick with. If you pick a diet that you can't stick with, you are just dooming yourself to failure. Because as we're going to talk about in a little while, really, you're going on a diet that you're going to follow for the rest of your life. Oops, I'm way jumping. See, I'm hovering over this touchpad, and it's so sensitive that it's just, it's, it's finishing my presentation before I'm ready. So physical activity guidelines. How does physical activity fit in? Well, people tend to grab onto, of course, the minimum amount of thing that they see. And right now, the, the activity guideline for overall health is 150 minutes of moderate and intensity aerobic activity each week, which breaks down to maybe 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes on like five days per week. That's for overall health. The fine print in those guidelines that generally people skip over is to meet weight control goals. You're looking probably at a minimum of 300 moderate intensity, 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity each week, perhaps more, and that's a lot of minutes. And we're going to see going forward, people who maintain weight loss, especially, tend to exercise around 60 minutes a day or so, which is not achievable for many people in today's society. Just a couple of tips I like to throw up in the discussion of physical activity is that the general rule is that whether you are walking or jogging, you burn about 100 calories per mile. And people think, well, how can that be true? You burn way more calories when you're jogging. And it, it's what the, ex, what the experts tell us is it's because you're covering a longer distance in a shorter time. So vigorous intensity activity, like jogging, is far more time efficient for weight control, for, for meeting those those recommendations if you are able to exercise at a vigorous intensity pace. And the, the one um, statistic that never fails to boggle my mind, and to me is the best, best argument against anyone who says, I'm going to keep eating whatever I want, I'm just going to focus on exercise, is using this math, if you run a 26-mile marathon, you burn 2,600 calories. And that's 900 calories less than you need to lose one pound of fat. So even after running a marathon, you probably haven't lost a pound. And if that's not the most depressing thing you've ever heard, then like, come up afterwards and tell me what it is. <laughs> so that brings us to the role of pharmacotherapy. And I will summarize this at the beginning by just telling you we do not have what people want. 
Pharmacotherapy has to take kind of one of two approaches right now. It either has to decrease, you know, if you think back to our balance, it either has to decrease the input or it has to increase the output. So we either have medications that decrease how much we're eating, like sort of decrease appetite, or interfere with nutrient absorption, so you know, decrease the input after we've eaten it, or it, we rev up the metabolism, essentially. What we do know for sure is that medication alone so far is not effective unless it is accompanied by diet and, diet and exercise, specifically a reduced calorie eating. It's in addition to, not in place of. In general, the medications that have been available, you could be expected to achieve a 4 to 6% weight loss in addition to what you would have lost just from reduced calorie eating. That's not, a, that's not a lot. It's certainly not what people want. And we generally find that if you lost weight with the aid of a weight loss medication, that weight loss comes back if you don't continue to take the medication. So we're looking at a chronic med. Now, just think about it. Is this, is this just a dream drug for, the, for any pharmaceutical company? You've got potentially two-thirds of the country as targets for it. It's something you're going to have to take every day for the rest of your life. And it's something that generally people are interested in. So when I tell you that there is a lot of research activity going on in this, I cannot even emphasize to you how much activity, because the, 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 just the general predictions are that anybody who gets this right, it's not just the next Lipitor. It's like Lipitor Plus. You know, this is going to be the number one drug, and probably like nobody can even imagine one that's going to come close. So up until now, for, you know, for a very long time, and especially going back to our 1998 guidelines, we generally have had two drugs approved for long-term use. Right? I don't really have to tell anybody about these. We know them. We have Orlistat, which for the most part now is the non-prescription product ally, which works as the interfering with nutrient absorption. And we all know, I don't need to go through the litany of, I mean, let's face it, not really great adverse effects with that med. I remember at the very, when Zenical, when the prescription product was out and they were doing the direct-to-consumer advertising on TV, I remember my husband, who's a physician, a dermatologist, but um, we were watching the TV and, and this drug was new out and I didn't know much about it. And they start reading off that litany of adverse effects. And we just kind of look at each other and go like, when does this drug sound good? You know, like, 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 like at the point, like at what point do you go, yeah, that's the one I want to try. Now, I, I don't mean to, to be that way. I know a lot of people, you know, there are people who use Ally and they swear by it, especially, you know, it helps with sort of like if you eat way too much fat, it's a wonderful feedback mechanism, but it's, it's really not the one that most people are going to go, yeah, that's the drug I want to take. All right, so then we also had Subutramine, which worked, um, revving up the metabolism. Oh, no, I'm sorry, no, no, we're going to get to that. Um, so you mean decreasing the input, so you know, kind of an appetite suppressant. And, um, but unfortunately, as we know, um, that's gone. That was withdrawn. Because another problem that we have is when you, you saw the, the uh, little graphic I threw up earlier about showing all of those many complicated things that are involved with the appetite regulation, it's, it's not done... Um, just in a silo. You start messing with that system. You start messing with a whole lot of other stuff. So in general, the diet drugs that we're seeing are, um, they're, they're coming with a whole lot of side effects that are either unwanted or downright scary. So that was 1998. Okay, 1999. I think, I think Meridia was just, I'm not sure if it was approved. I think it was approved in 99. But since then, we've just had this kind of drought. And the FDA came up with some new approval criteria for what they were going to consider to be an effective weight management drug. And there were two, there were, you had to meet one of two efficacy benchmarks. You either, the drug either had to produce a mean weight loss that was more than 5% after one year and was significantly different from placebo. So a mean weight loss that was 5% greater than what was seen in placebo and was significantly different. Or at least 35% of their subjects on the drug had to lose at least 5% of their baseline body weight after one year. And again, and this had to be, it had to be, I think, double 
oh, like the, the percentage had to be double that of placebo. These are just, you know, these are minor points. But basically, you don't have to show a huge effect. Like the bottom line is you don't have to show a huge effect to get approved as a weight loss drug. You do, though, have to show some, some sort of um, effect on some of these secondary endpoints, the cardiometabolic endpoints. So now we have our first new agent since 1999. We have lorcasserin, which is Belvik, and we have the combina combination of fentermine and tapiramate, which is, surprisingly to me, Cusimia. I have been calling this Cusimia for a long time. I saw a phonetic of it the other day in the New York Times. It's Cusimia. And it was supposed to be Cunexa. So anyone who's carrying that around, get that out of your head. It's now Cusimia. I, I meant to mention fentramine has been approved as a weight management drug for some time, but it's only approved for short-term use as a single agent up to 12 weeks. And since we're looking at chronic meds, I just tend not to talk about it. Um, so. These two drugs came, were approved and now have been introduced around the same time, and they have, been, they have just fused in my head on the same neuron. I have been really having a hard time just keeping them apart in my head, and perhaps you can see a little bit why. Lorcasserin is the selective serotonin receptor agonist, and fentramine obviously is the combination of a sympathomimetic and an, an anti-epileptic agent. Lorcasserin is dosed twice daily, um, Cusimia is once daily in the morning to prevent any insomnia that would be associated with the fentanyl. But after that, um, we, we tend to see like kind of a lot of similarities here. They both kind of work on the appetite suppression, satiety enhancement. They both are um, Schedule Four controlled substances. The Cusimia because of the fentanyl component. They're both pregnancy category X. And in the specific case of Cusimia, it is absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy because of the possibility of cleft palate. And because of that, it is available only through the limited distribution channels through certified pharmacies under a REMS protocol. So Belvique is the one that's more widely available. Cusimia is the one that's under limited distribution. And um, either one of them needs to, is supposed to be continued if the patient has not experienced at least a 5% weight loss after 12 weeks, because they're not likely to be effective past that if the patient hasn't, um, hasn't experienced it by then. Now, again, think about, if you think about who really is probably the, cat, the target market for these meds, I would think there's a lot of women of childbearing age, right? And we have two meds that are pregnancy category X. So let's look a little close, a little more closely, quickly at lorcasserin. It was studied in three clinical trials, three primary clinical trials, Bloom, Blossom, and Bloom DM. I have to tell you, I'm so amused anymore at the names of these clinical trials. Like if you look, they, they obviously come up with the acronym first, and then do whatever they can to fit the words <laughs> into it. Because if you ever look at what some of these things, what they actually mean, they're just ridiculous. So we'll just call them by their ac acronyms, because clearly that's what everyone wanted. Bloom and Blossom and Bloom Diabetes. Bloom was, um, it, the Bloom trial looked at lorcasserin, what, what became the approved um, dosage and regimen, the 10 milligrams twice daily, versus placebo, with an average weight loss of about 13 pounds at one year. Blossom also looked at whether they could do once daily, and the bottom line was no, they couldn't, so we got, what, got the twice daily um, schedule. The Bloom DM was looked specifically at patients with type 2 diabetes and did show improvements in A1C and, fast, and fasting glucose, along with a, with a weight loss of about 13, you know, all of these right around 11 to 13 pounds. Again, think about it though. How much weight are people usually looking to lose? You know, it's not 13 pounds. It's not 11 pounds. It's like, it could be 50, 60 pounds. So, again, not what people are looking for. And I, I don't mean to, to diminish the, the possible value of these drugs because there, people need something to help them. And as we know, even the 10% weight loss has been shown to have a lot of beneficial effects on, the var you know, on various cardiometabolic measures. So, but we're not looking at, this is not the cosmetic drug. Okay, this is the sort of like do it for health drug and people need to understand what they're getting when they start taking the therapy. So with Bloom, I'm not going to, quite bluntly, I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch
bunch of charts and statistics here, but this is mostly to show that in the bloom, which again was the drug versus placebo, 47% of patients um, got a, a, achieved at least a 5% weight loss, 22 at least a 10% weight loss. Okay, so not huge response for a lot of dropouts, an average weight loss of about 5.8 kilograms, 13 pounds. This was the Blossom trial, and um, what they saw was the greatest weight loss was with the twice daily schedule, which is what we ended up with. Again, similar kind of proportions, right? About half of people were able to lose 5%, uh, about a fifth or so able to lose 10%. And this is the Bloom, um, di the Bloom DM and the diabetes trial. Didn't see as much weight loss, lower percentages of people responding. The, the adverse effects are sort of divided up into whether you're just um, the, the regular trials or the diabetes-specific trial. And it's, it's just, you know, kind of stuff you'd expect. Headache, dizziness, fatigue, and sort of that you're messing around with the, with the, the CNS, so we're going to see some CNS effects. With Bloom, they were also seeing some hypoglycemia. And then we start getting into the scary stuff for the safety. Could, it, in, could induce serotonin syndrome. There's a question about whether it's going to cause valvular heart disease, and indeed there is an ongoing um, cardio, cardiovascular risk study. Could cause cognitive impairment. You know, now I'm like that person reading off on the TV. Could cause psychiatric disorders, depression, suicidal ideation, priapism. You know, it's like, again, like holy cow. So then we move over then to Qsimia. Qsimia has a rather complicated dosage initiation and tit tit titration scheme. And on this graphic, we're moving this way and then back and then back again. You initiate it at a low dosage for 14 days. That's only meant for dose titration. Then you increase to the initial recommended long-term dose, which is 7.5 milligrams and 46 milligrams once daily. If after 12 weeks you haven't achieved the 5% weight loss, or I'm sorry, the at least a 3% weight loss, you either discontinue the drug or you escalate the dose. To escalate it, you use another sort of like fake dosage form because they're all fixed combinations for 14 days to help bump you up. And then you increase to what's the real um, maintenance dosage of 15 and 92 once daily. You evaluate again after 12 weeks. And if at that point, if the person hasn't lost 5% of baseline, you discontinue the drug. So this is not an easy scheme for people. Oop. That's letting me know that I need to reset my clock. Thank you for thank you for pausing with me. So um, so as I mentioned, there are two do there's four dosage four fixed dosage combinations of Qsimia, two of which are used only for titration purposes for 14 days each. You're supposed to avoid dosing in the evening because of the risk of insomnia. And when you discontinue Qsimia, you have to follow a similar kind of weaning off to avoid um, inducing seizures. So Qsimia was, was also looked at in three clinical trials, Conquer, Sequel, and Equip. Seriously, they don't just come by these like, oh, look, we ended up with these words, Conquer, Sequel, and Equip. Conquer was the main one. Sequel was a, an, a continuation, like an extension study where some folks in Conquer just kept taking the drug for another year. And, it, and in those two studies, the patients who were, and in most of these studies, it's, it's mainly white women. You know, the majority of, of the study populations are white women. In Conquer and Sequel, the, the, they had to have, uh, they had to be any of those categories that would qualify under the guidelines for weight management. They also had to have two or more comorbidities from that list. Equip was relatively healthy younger patients. They had to have a BMI of at least 35, and there was no cap to, to BMI to be included in that study. So what we saw in this study is that um, the higher dose, as could be expected, um, ended up in greater weight, in, in greater weight loss. But we're in just basically bottom line with Qsimia is we're seeing greater efficacy than we were seeing with lorcaserin. So here, about a 10% weight loss average with the, with the higher dosages. And as you can see on the bottom graphs, in these studies, 70% um, of people on the higher dosage were able to achieve at least a 5% weight loss, versus it was around 50 for lorcaserin. And almost half um, were able to achieve at least a 10% weight loss. So greater efficacy. And this, what they showed here, oh, and which I forgot to point out in the other study, 
um, for lorcasterone. But what they showed here is, is if you kept taking the drug, you sustained your weight loss. And there was a graph, you, if you can look back at it in the handout, I'm pretty sure it's in there. But what they did with lorcasterin is at the end of one year, they re-randomized people. And so people who had been on the drug might have ended up on placebo or you know, vice versa. And what they found is the people who went off the drug after one year started gaining weight. So just again, the evidence that you have to stay on the drug to maintain the weight loss. So the summary results for Qsimia, and by the way, I keep using the brand name here just because it's really hard to keep saying fentamine to pyramine. So please know that that's what I need to say, and it's just for expedition. But at the highest dose, 75% um, achieved at least a 5% weight loss, 50% at least 10. The mean weight loss here was about 22 pounds, which is better. You know, now, I mean, we're getting more into what people are looking for. And we also, more with Qsimia than with Lorcasterin, saw significant improvements in, those car in, in many of the cardiometabolic uh, measures, where for Lorcasterin, it was for fewer of them. But now we start getting into the adverse effects, which are, again, the kind of things you'd expect to be seeing when you're starting to fool around in the central nervous system. Paresthesias, dizziness, dysgeusia, insomnia, constipation, dry mouth, all favorites, right? And then we have the contraindications. Pregnancy, glaucoma, hyperthyroidism. The pregnancy one, very specifically being um, that you have to have a negative pregnancy test before treatment and a monthly negative pregnancy test thereafter and have to be using at least two forms of birth control. And this is monitored through the limited distribution program. You, there, it is also recommended to monitor heart rate, monitor for depression and suicidal thoughts, can cause mood and sleep disorders, and disturbances in attention and memory. So, at the end of the day, we have two new drugs. We have two new drugs that are effective. We have two new drugs that don't necessarily do what people want them to do, and two new drugs where you really have to evaluate the benefit, the risk versus benefit ratio for people, which is why I think you haven't heard a ton about these drugs, because they are, they do come with limitations. So it's not the sort of blocking to a med that you would expect for a new weight loss drug. On the horizon, there are some uh, combinations with bupropion, one with naltrexone and one with zanisamide, that um, contra of the first one, bupropion and naltrexone, was turned down back in 2011, and um, the FDA requested a long-term cardiovascular safety study for that combination. It's called the LIGHT study, and it's currently underway. They're sort of, um, they're, it looks like they're targeting 2014 for possible approval. The other combination is in phase three trials. Beyond that, I can tell you that almost anything you could pick out of that diagram, and that's not even a comprehensive diagram, they are looking at everything. Everything and anything you could possibly imagine is it going to work. And, and specifically, some meds, in, you know, look at the very top of the list, some meds that are currently approved for diabetes are being looked at as standalone weight loss agents. And then we just get into targeting, like I said, anything and everything that might possibly work. So really, I'd say it's, you know, stay tuned, because there's going to be a lot of developments. There's also the very, very first indications that we might end up having something that works on the other side of the equation, which is the exercise equation. So uh, an unlock, unlike fentermine, um, rather than just sort of revving up metabolism, this one seems, this is an animal study, but what they found was that um, this, this drug, um, it worked like exercise in a bottle. I don't really want to go in, into the specifics of it just for time, but, but it, it sort of made muscles act as though they were working out. And while the drug, while the people who were looking at this drug were really talking about it, like, no, we're looking at it for patients who have disease states or some other kind of condition where they can't move their muscles. You know where the thinking went, was, hey, nobody wants to exercise. We got exercise in a pill. We got ourselves a blockbuster. So who knows? We're still in animal studies here. And one thing we don't know, and what, what really is starting to get more attention, is maybe what we need the medications for, really, is to target weight maintenance rather than weight loss. Because that's really where we're seeing the, the, the struggles. People who are able to lose weight are having a very, very, very hard time maintaining it. So expect to see more focus on that. So rather the one that's going to actually help with the loss, more help with the maintenance as we figure out what it is that's driving weight regain. So what do we know about maintaining weight loss? 
Successful weight maintenance is defined as a weight regain of less than about seven pounds in two years after a weight loss, or a sustained reduction in waist circumference. Most of what we know about weight maintenance comes from the National Weight Control Registry, which is a, a, a longitudinal, longitudinal perspective study of now, I think it's more than 5,000 people who've lost at least 30 pounds and maintained that weight loss for at least a year. I decided to join this registry, and I'm really embarrassed. I never put, I never put my questionnaire in. I never submitted my questionnaire. I think it's like 25 pages long. When I tell you that they investigate every single aspect of what these folks are doing to maintain weight, I am not kidding you. But the, and the average registry member has lost about 66 pounds and kept it off for five years, although there's been a huge range in, in the weight loss that's reflected in this population. So what are they doing? How are they, how are they successful where so many people are not? And what they're finding is that people who successfully lose, who successfully maintain a weight loss continue to act like recently successful weight losers for many years. Specifically, they continue to consume a low-calorie, low-fat diet. Women about 1,300 calories a day, men about 1,700 calories a day. If you think back to when I first started talking and gave those targets, you know, the target for a woman in my age bracket is about 1,600. For men, it's more like 2,000. People, they, they do caution that people may be underestimating that self-reported calorie intake, but basically what they do is they essentially keep eating what they were eating while they were losing weight, you know, that same kind of pattern. They also exercise in high levels of physical activity, except for me, I have to be honest, I don't. It would help a lot, I should be doing it, but I don't. I, I'm waiting for the pill. So, um, they do a mean of 60 to 75 minutes per day of moderate intensity activity, or 35 to, you know, 35 to 40 minutes per day of, of vigorous activity. But again, there was a lot of variability in that. So they, they, they do what we hear, they eat less, and they exercise more. They also, some things that have been trending in that, that cohort about what's been successful is most people eat breakfast. Most people weigh themselves at least once a day to try to catch an upswing and take care of it before it, it really ends up being a, you know, a weight regain. And they tend not to watch a lot of television. I guess, you know, instead they're all, they seem to be out exercising if you look at the data. What we don't know about weight maintenance is whether an individual approach to macronutrient content would facilitate um, long-term weight maintenance. So in other words, looking at those macronutrient distributions, is it possible that some sort of diet would be better for weight maintenance, would be more helpful with that? One of the things that is, um, to me, just a heartbreaking finding about weight loss is that weight loss seems to permanently decrease your energy expenditure. What this study looked at was three groups of people. Um, one who was weight stable, you know, they're just, they had been at a certain weight and had been that weight for a little bit of time. One group that had recently lost some weight, and one group that had lost weight but had kept it off. And I'm, I'm thinking in the study it was for a year, at least, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was for at least a couple of months. So, and what they did is, they, like, just based on, on their height, weight, all the other things that get factored into a, a predictor equation for what their total ex energy expenditure should be per day, they did the predicted, and then they actually measured over a 24-hour period in, you know, in a very controlled environment how much the energy expenditure was. And what they found was for the weight-stable people, the first line, as you can see, it was very, very close to the prediction. The recent weight loss it was about 500 calories less than predicted. And to me, the, the heartbreaking one, for sustained weight loss, it was almost as much as if they had recently lost weight. So weight loss seems to depress our energy expenditure and, and keep it depressed, even after we've lost weight, which would then kind of correlate with the thinking that we need to keep eating a reduced calorie plan because we're not burning as much. So if we start eating more and more, we have a smaller metabolic, you know, we have this smaller energy expenditure, which is, which is one explanation for why it is so easy to regain weight. And what they also found was that the biggest effect was on activity energy expenditure. So even if you're out there walking and walking and jogging and jogging, you're not burning as many calories as somebody who never lost weight, which is, again, you know, sort of is in keeping with that idea that for weight, for weight management purposes, you have to exercise a whole lot more. 
a very re a recent study last year did take a look at three diets to see if they had any influence on this, on whether energy expenditure was ex was suppressed after weight loss. They looked at a very low carb diet, which essentially is a high protein diet, which essentially is an Atkins like diet, the low glycemic index diet, and a low fat diet. And what they found was that the the Atkins like diet was actually best, but it had some there were some concerns about long-term, you know, possible deleterious long-term effects. And the one that really came up as being the sweet spot was the low glycemic index diet, which, which as you can see, um, what it showed here was that it had um, the, the, the effect on resting energy expenditure and total energy expenditure was similar to the very low carb diet but it didn't have the same sort of deleterious effect. So the bottom line on this one, again, without kind of over explaining the data, is that it's looking like following a low glycemic index plan for both weight loss and for weight maintenance probably is the way to go. And again, not looking necessarily at any book that has you constantly book or plan that has you constantly looking at the glycemic index and planning your meals that way, but more just trying to, to concentrate on the, the whole grains the things that we all know that we're supposed to be eating. So basically, where this leaves us is that we kind of, we know what to do, we just don't do it, right? <laughs> Which is why I went into coaching. Coaching is sort of helping people do what they want to do and they're not doing. So whenever people ask me about weight management and weight loss, my number one recommendation is usually a question back to them. Do you want to lose weight or do you want to weigh less? In other words, is, is all you care about is losing some weight? <laughs> Or do you, is what you're caring about is getting to a, a lower weight and maintaining it? Because a lot of times our focus really has been on like lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. We tend to forget that there's a whole lot that comes after that. So if you want to weigh less, basically what you're looking at is a renovation of your entire life for the remainder of your life. And as James Hill, who is a prominent obesity researcher, says, except for the fortunate few people who are not going to gain weight no matter what they do, you cannot live life today in our society and maintain a normal weight. Which to me is comforting on some level. <laughs> so what I tell people is, first of all, you have to make sure you really want it, that, that weighing less and maintaining that weight loss is something that you are so committed to that basically you are going to be, for, for the rest of your life, probably like a salmon swimming against the stream. Our environment does not help us maintain weight loss. The reason I started putting weight back on is because I, my, what I was doing for freelance work switched a little bit. I was doing more traveling. And just heaven help, help you if you are trying to eat 1,400 calories a day while you're traveling, or even trying to maintain a healthy, you know, kind of eating pattern while you're traveling. I, I, I decided I don't know how to invent an app. I mean, I don't know how to make an app. They just sort of appear on my iPhone. You know, but if I knew how to make that happen, I was going to invent the, um, the vegetable finder. Because like when you're traveling, just try to encounter a vegetable. It, it's really, really challenging. So I was going to have people, you know, like, like write in and say, hey, I found some carrots at the, you know, at the airport. So. So make sure you really want it because you are in for a lot of work and and mean, you know a lot of work and a lot of of dedication to sticking to a lower calorie eating plan at least until we get the drug that we're all hoping for you have to stick to the lower calorie eating plan and you have to um, ideally exercise a lot more than you probably are I say to start with the end in mind think about how ideally you would like to be eating because, well, because forever, because that is what you're going to be doing forever. So try to make your weight loss plan be the one that you want to stick with for the long term. Because it, the, a big problem with weight loss and weight maintenance is that it really is changing a lot of behaviors. And we know that behavior change is extremely difficult. So if you can change those behaviors up front and then just stick with them, don't look at the like the short term, you know, just the weight loss, I'm going to get this off fast and then I'll worry about the rest later. I can guarantee you that it's, you're not going to want to worry about the rest later. Because in that weight loss period, you know, you get a lot of positive feedback. Hey, you look great. Are you losing weight? Wow, look at you. I can tell
tell you, after five years, nobody gets up and says, hey, you're still lost weight, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like just up to me. So, you know, what, if behavior change is hard, do it when you're getting a lot of positive feedback, and then you'll have it when nobody, nobody's saying anything anymore. Um, consider your habits when you're creating that calorie deficit. Don't look at going, like, to use the Atkins uh, diet as an example, the reason that sort of fell out of favor is people found that for the long term nobody could just do that. Like, after a while, I think people broke down and they went to an Italian restaurant and they like, just like, went insane with spaghetti because, you know, in the bread basket, they just couldn't do it. Make sure it is, try to make your calorie deficit fit into your current habits. I told my dad, once that, um, you know, you don't have to change anything about what you're currently eating, really. There's a sort of, I should have thrown up my Venn diagram. If you think of two ovals intersecting, we have eating for health purposes, and we have eating for weight loss. And really, ideally, there's that middle intersection where your, where your weight management eating pattern is also an extremely healthy one, but you can lose weight just by eating less of everything you eat right now. So my dad was really into his ice cream treat every day. And I said, you know, Dad, like, just ladle out half as much and see after the end of that if you still, you know, wait a couple of minutes and see if you really, really, truly need more. And he lost a bunch of weight just by ladling out half as much ice cream. So you don't have to do something fancy. You know, you just have to eat less. And you can do that with what you're currently eating. And then just to know that you're in it for the long haul. So don't go into things thinking that like, oh, you know, I'll just tough this out for a while. I'm sorry to say you're, you're going to be toughing it out for quite some time. If someone asks me for a specific recommendation right now, my specific recommendation would be to get the book, The Dash Diet for Weight Loss, which is the one I was making fun of earlier because of that ridiculous chart. But just the Dash Diet is really the diet that the eating plan, you know, the Dash Diet for hypertension. So it's not really a weight reduction diet. The Dash eating plan that's really for hypertension, more and more is what is just being recommended for, for everything, you know, for just good cardiovascular health as a, uh, as sort of a, a baseline for, for good type 2 diabetes, eating planning. So the, the, one of the people who was involved in creating the DASH diet came out with this book explaining how to adapt it for a weight loss diet. And interestingly to me, the, what's on the whatever side that is when you're looking at the screen, I guess the right of the screen to you. CVS's Minute Clinic has just introduced a weight loss program, and it, they have partnered with DASH for Health to create a weight loss program based on the DASH diet. So you can't go wrong here. It, if, if this is a way, though, that will be something that you can sustain. So people looking for a recommendation, that is the one I would give.